When you're ready. <clears throat> Welcome everyone to the August 1st, 2022 meeting of the Delaware County Board of Commissioners. Would you please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Thank you. We've got a full house today. Welcome. I'm Barb Lewis, President. To my right is our Vice President, Jeff Benton. To my left, fellow Commissioner Gary Merrill and our Administrator, Tracy Davies, our Clerks, Jennifer Walraven and Sarah DeNovo. We can begin. Resolution number 22-627 in the matter of approving the electronic record of proceedings from regular meeting held July 28th, 2022. So moved. Second. Discussion, vote. Vote on motion 22-627, Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. We do not have any public comment today, so that brings us to item number three, resolution number 22-628, in the matter of approving purchase orders and now certificates and payments of warrants in batch number CM APR 0729. So moved. Second. Discussion. Vote. Vote on motion 22-628, Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Resolution number 22-629 in the matter of canceling the Delaware County Commissioner's session scheduled for Thursday, August 25th, 2022. So moved. Second. Discussion. Vote. Vote on motion 22-629, Mr. Benton. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Resolution number 22-630 in the matter of accepting and approving the Delaware County Sheriff's Office Transport Report for the month of June, 2022. So moved. Second. Discussion, vote. Vote on motion 22-630, Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Benton. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Resolution number 22-631, in the matter of proclaiming August 2022 as Child Support Awareness Month in Delaware County. So moved. Second. Discussion. Good morning. Joyce Bowens, Director of Delaware County Child Support. And we're here this morning because of August is uh, Child Support Awareness Month. Child support program encourages responsible parenting, family self-sufficiency, and child well-being by providing services to locate parents, establish paternity, establish and modify and enforce obligations, and collect child support for the children. Unlike other programs based on, upon income, we serve the families from newly separated or divorced parents, never married parents, and relatives and relative caretaker regardless of incoming circumstances. One in three children are affected by this program. And total collections for federal, federal fiscal year were 1.7 billion. Um, we do have a proclamation this morning. I don't know if you want to read it. You want me to read it or? Any or comments? comments? I know we have a, yeah. Yeah, I think it's wonderful right. to read. Any comments from the commissioners first? We'll, we'll vote. Okay, did you want to read the proclamation or did you want Joyce to read the proclamation or? Um, I think we will just uh, go ahead and okay. vote. All right, 22-631. Two, two Mr. Benton? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Joyce, I'd like to thank you. You have so many awards, you and, and uh, and, and your wonderful staff, and you just do a great job, and it is a tough job. I, I, can't, I can't imagine, and uh, congratulations. And uh, calling to mind what we're, oh boy, what we're uh, passing today with this proclamation, it, it's a great reminder of, of people who are suffering and those who you are helping day in and day out. And we really, really appreciate it. And I do have my st some of my staff here this morning. Sure. So. Which one? Would anybody else like to speak? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Okay. All righty. Let's get a picture. Get a picture. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Item number seven, um, Deanna Brandt with the Executive Director of the Delaware Moro Mental Health and Recovery Services Board has some presentation updates for us this morning. Good morning and thank you for having me. And I promise you, I have about 14 slides, but a couple of those are questions. And frankly, I have some updates on a state and national level that I hope you'll have questions about. So I'm gonna start with, of course, Uh, brief overview of our board, our mission, and our vision, and I certainly won't read that to you line and verse. I will tell you in terms of an update, in the last census, we became the 11th largest board area in the state based upon population, and you'll see a theme throughout all of the strategic planning that we do that is based on growth, and then measurement of four factors with our providers, effectiveness, access, efficiency, and satisfaction with services. Um, one of the things I will say is we meet 11 times a year. Um, now that the virtual meeting provision apparently is gone, we will resume meeting. We hope at the DACC they've allowed us to use their space. Our next meeting is our annual meeting. You've all been invited. <laughs> Please RSVP if you have not already. And this year it's in Morrow County because we serve both board areas and we're required to meet in both areas. But you'll see that theme of meeting the changing needs of a growing community throughout everything that we do. Um, this is our current board structure, and the only reason I kind of revisit this is because I'm gonna talk a little bit about House Bill 523 that some of you and I have talked about prior, that's currently in the House Behavioral Services and Support Subcommittee, which essentially means it's probably dead until the lame duck session in the fall. Um, but that bill potentially would change some of what our board is structured as now. We have 14 members, representation from both counties. That ratio is based upon population, so currently we have 12 Delaware residents on our board and two more county residents. And then we have eight full-time employees. Now, this is what the ORC, which gives boards the authority to exist, says about the services that we need to ensure exist. Now, there's two words that are frequently left out of this conversation in regards to 3402, and that is resources allowing. So not every county services are gonna look the same even though this network or continuum of care is actually required. It won't always look the same. Local boards have local control under the authority of the board members that you actually help appoint. Um, I'm gonna briefly go through our providers and focus on the fact that we started in 2017 with eight providers, we currently have 12. We had a provider cease providing services in February of this year. And when we talk about our new systems, I'll talk about who stepped into that role. So Delmore Dwellings, and some of you may be familiar with their Courage Court Permanent Supportive Housing Project on Firestone and Curtis Helpline, which I'm also gonna come back to in regards to 988. <laughs> Jacob's Way, our uh, recovery housing here in Delaware. Mary Haven, um, substance abuse treatment. Um, NAMI of Delaware and Morrow counties. And actually, as a pilot, they have been asked to expand to Union County, obviously at Union County's cost. So eventually, we'll likely be a NAMI of Central Ohio. Safe Harbor Peer Support Services that has an office and a site over here on Paddock Court. Southeast Healthcare. Now, Southeast Healthcare really is the type of behavioral health agency that 340 was designed to support. It's all services for severely mentally ill adults. That's their primary focus, that's what they do. Sintero, our child and family provider, who also has a very significant school based footprint. They have a school based program that we fund that places clinicians and treatment and prevention staff in every school district in both counties. And then Turning Point, our local family violence shelter. These are the three new ones. Um, big Brothers, Big Sisters, um, peer mentoring um, for young people. We went with a program that could expand mentoring to all at-risk youth in both counties. Now, you know, the issue, of course, is recruiting and retaining mentors, so the level of 
their expansion is really going to be based on that. So if anybody has ever thought about being a big, come see me because we need you. Um, Cornerstone of Hope, a Mid-Ohio Traumatic Loss Response Team. So one of the interesting um, pieces of research about people who commit suicide or overdose is that there tends to be the risk of contagion with survivors, with their first degree relatives, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, children, um, and those are in their direct circle. So a postvention response um, where we can go out to the homes of families who want it, who ask for it, who are okay with it, or do delayed follow-up with families who want that maybe a couple days, a week, a month later, and then do follow-up for up to a year is a postvention program that's been found to be preventive of future suicides and overdoses. This is um, entirely federally funded. We actually, in the planning process, got state opiate response dollars to support this. It's a regional initiative. We share costs based upon the number of responses with Marion and Crawford counties. So it's a four county regional approach. Uh, we're very excited by that. If you've not heard of Cornerstone, they have a footprint in northern Franklin County and in Cleveland and Lima, faith-based agency. Um, we're hoping to have a significant footprint here. And then the last one is PASS. I referred to an agency who closed. We had already recruited a provider of school-based prevention services to step into a more integrated with the school platform for prevention. That's PASS. They've been here for about a year and a half and are in every school who wants the two programs that they currently run. Are there questions about any of that before I keep going? Okay. You knew I was going to say this. What are our challenges? You know, it used to be that behavioral health was set up in such a way that access was driven by the agency, how they wanted to be designed. They wanted consumers to come to them. That's no longer the case. And unfortunately for us, we have made that shift in the last five years in a period of time when we don't have sufficient workforce. Every bit of accessibility that we measure is dictated by the availability of workforce. And I hope you're gonna to speak to this, Farah, because we share a program that we co-fund that was wildly successful here in Delaware. We collaborated on this. It started before my time here with two uh, behavioral health clinicians who could provide in-home supports to older adults in Delaware who needed behavioral health care but couldn't come to the office. And the absolute provision of those services is dictated by one thing, and that's the availability of workforce. We have providers with a 10 to 30% current opening rate and no candidates. Our candidate pool has been diminished over the course of, and I'm gonna say the last 10 years, probably longer than that. And we're doing a lot of research around COVID, the great resignation, and, and the impact of that. But ours is really based upon some other things that started years ago, which you know started with the retirement of baby boomers from our system without a sufficient candidate pool coming up the pipeline behind them to take those jobs. Um, the second piece of that is going to be the number of initiatives that we're going to talk about here in one moment. Uh, the second challenge is health equity. Um, speaking of health equity, and again to you know, our work in collaboration with SourcePoint, when we work with older adults in this country, those clinicians are required to have one kind of license in order to bill Medicare, and what do most older adults have as their third-party payer source? Medicare. So if we're already limited in our candidate pool, and of those two available people, none of them have the right license, they can't bill it. So then who do they bill? Their local board. We absorb the cost. We're not able to recoup that revenue. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but one of the things that we've done around health equity and cultural competence is Kyle Lewis wrote a grant for about $75,000 to help us start working on a plan to address these issues. So we're gonna be inviting you to participate in that process if you choose. And there's much more to it than just that example, but that's, that's a good place to start. 
When we talk about the number of initiatives in Ohio, those initiatives are wonderful things. The governor has made it his priority focus to work on building out the behavioral health system. We're all in favor of that. It'll be wonderful in two to three years when that build out is done, I think you'll see a system that's absolutely been strengthened. In the interim though, it diverts what? Workforce. Some of the statewide initiatives we'll talk about needed 589 behavioral health staff to get off the ground, which came from our local workforce. Really, um, you know, came at a time when we didn't have folks to spare. Um, and then provider service space, that's an ongoing issue in both counties. We continue to look for appropriate, affordable space for our providers to help them stay in business. Um, one of the things I referred to very early, and, um, and I, you know, I'm aware this is a marathon and not a sprint, but House Bill 523 is incredibly important to us. The passage of this bill would give a long overdue modernization to the code section in the ORC that gives boards their authority and describes how they're composed. Um, these are the important pieces to it. It has about 14 different elements, and it was actually um, sponsored by Representative Swearingen out of the 89th District. I'm, I'm gonna say this, um, gives commissioners and boards authority to change board size. So we're currently a 14 member board. There are other boards in Ohio that are 18 members. That was allowed about 10 years ago in the Ohio Revised Code with a sunset provision. So if you didn't move to 14, you stayed 18. This um, bill would allow us to discuss a nine member, a 12 member, a 14 member, a 15 member, or an 18 member board size every four years. Now, because we're a two county system, we would have to discuss that as a group, the board with both sets of commissioners, but it would allow for that. It would allow more representation with people with lived experience. We have categorical designations now, and I know we've, we've talked about this. We have requirements about the background of folks who are on our board. This would just broaden the scope and say, half of your board needs to be someone with lived experience or a family member of a person with lived experience. The most important part for me um, and our board, I believe is the elimination of 340036D. I didn't list it line and verse. I can quote this code language line and verse. This is called the 120 day notice statute. We are the sole public entity in Ohio that I'm aware of that is required in our contracting process to give 120 days notice to any provider we contract with of any proposed termination and slash or, very important, substantial changes to a contract. Um, that language is really, in our belief, needs to live in the contract. That provider's due process rights and our due process rights, we believe, should move into the individual contract with a provider. Um, in our experience, it's not been enforceable. It's a bi-directional statute where we're also supposed to receive notice, but it also goes to quality of care. Um, and the example I've given historically, and I, you know, ODOT, if they hire a paver who has poor quality work, do they have to wait four months to terminate that contract and have a good faith negotiation process about the work that they did? And we do. Um, we'd really like to align 340, 340 itself with all other public contracting practices. We can protect those due process rights in the contract. Um, and then allows Medicaid data about behavioral health to go to boards. We are the planning entity for Medicaid recipients and behavioral health care and yet don't have access to that data anymore. Um, there is permissive language, excuse me, in 42 CFR and in HIPAA that allows it, but the state of Ohio doesn't do it. And we, we're asking for that. So there are 14 elements to House Bill 523, but I, I tried to hit the highlights and if you have questions for me, which you might, please let me know. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about those initiatives that I referred to, and I'm going to start with 988. 
So I don't know, and I should know, so please forgive me. Are we all familiar with the basic premise of 988? Three-digit psychiatric emergency number. It had a national rollout, was passed in federal law three years ago. So the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services contracted with a company called Vibrant Emotional Health to plan, design, and implement 988 in Ohio. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure, and then I'm going to hope you take away a couple things um, from this. Um, so Ohio chose to subcontract out the service with National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Certified Call Centers. That's a mouthful, but I will tell you here, we got lucky. Our helpline was already certified. So there were insufficient certified lifelines in Ohio. So in, the, these three, in this three-year planning window, other call centers got certified. Um, helpline threw their hat in the ring for Delaware, Morrow, and Union counties. Now they cover seven counties in their overall footprint, but were cautious enough to wait for the volume of calls to know what they could manage locally before they decide to throw their hat in the ring for a, a larger continuum. So there are three tiers of response, so that's how they make sure that every call gets answered. So if the first tier doesn't answer, it rolls over to the second. And then there's a statewide backup, that's the third tier. Um, two things, geolocation is not in place. I'm gonna give you the specific example that was given to us and then tell you about my testing of 988. And I, I, wanna, I wanna be clear, this is gonna be a wonderful tool when it's fully functional. It's just not fully functional yet. It will be. Eventually, it will be like 911 where no matter where you are, you call and you will get the closest crisis hotline to where you are logistically. Um, but because the geolocation is not functional, if you bought your cell phone in South Dakota and you move here and you call it, it will call South Dakota. And it will route you eventually back to your local call center. They expect that geolocation to be functional within a year. That's what I'm not doing, because <laughs> that's a really big deal. Um, so for me, I came here from Northeast Ohio. I tested it, and it calls either Ashby Lake or Mahoney, <laughs> depending on where the call gets routed, and then has to come back to Delaware County. Now the second piece of it is you can imagine a statewide system with 19 different providers needs shared resource directories, right? They need to know who to call in Delaware. That also is not functional yet. It will be. They've subcontracted out Omos and Vibrant with a company to create a shared resource directory. So ultimately, they will be able to quickly route your call. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. I'm going to say, too, for anybody who has a phone that's on a network, you have to program the number in. It won't go out. It'll say your call cannot be completed as dialed if you don't program 988 into your phones. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that, too. So how it works is you call the number. You go to the National Lifeline. It's an automated system. You go through a series of prompts and then get directed back to the helpline. So what I'm going to suggest and what we're going to message for the next six months is if you would have called the helpline, 211 or the helpline, call the helpline. <laughs> Continue to do that. And there will be circumstances where people you know, who are not familiar with that will call 988. But it, we're going to create efficiencies here by messaging. If you would have called the helpline, continue to do that because you'll go directly to them instead of taking the circuitous route, if that makes sense at all. So I hope that's the takeaway here for the moment. Call the helpline until that geolocation and shared resource directory is in place. Um, the second thing is Ohio Rise. Ohio Rise is not a um, Ohio Department of Mental Health program, and it's not a board program. It's an Ohio Department of Medicaid program. And I, without getting into too many of the nuts and bolts, essentially what it does is it takes Medicaid enrolled kids who have behavioral health needs out of the regular behavioral health Medicaid billing system. Carves them out. Now, if you are familiar with our system, we only carved them in like 10 years ago, but it's gonna carve them back out. 
Um, the Ohio Department of Medicaid uh, contracted with a managed care entity called Aetna Better Health to manage the behavioral health services for all of these high, higher acuity kids separately. They project they're going to have about 60,000 kids enrolled before it's done. Now here in Delaware, we have a pretty low Medicaid enrollment rate, um, but it's still going to have impact on us in a couple ways. One is workforce, because this system is here. It went live in July and will be you know, essentially competing for the same workforce. Um, the second way that this matters is what's called MRSS. So a higher rise is required to ensure that mobile response and stabilization services exist for this population in each county. They have requirements, they have certification, they have staffing guidelines, and um, in various, some counties, we're not the only one, um, there was not a logical provider to take that on. So they don't have anybody yet to provide the service, but eventually they will. So we'll see new providers who will be fully Medicaid funded, who will come into Delaware and Morrow and other counties as well, and provide mobile crisis services. Um, so just want you to keep that in mind. And then last is Beat the Stigma, messaging campaign um, from the Ohio Opioid Education Alliance and Kyle Lewis is doing a lot of work on getting this messaging out. So you're gonna see a lot of information for us around Beat the Stigma and the toolkit that's attached to that. And we hope we'll have a lot of um, collaborative messaging with some of you. So what we're working on now in terms of building for the future and infrastructure obviously is um, administrative offices for our board staff. Um, and then our big capital project at the moment is in Morrow County. We own a building there. We've owned it for 30 years. We're in the process of a multi-million dollar and unfortunately growing um, renovation and expansion project to add providers to that service space so that Morrow County has access to care. Um, I will say in terms of the Morrow County project, it, uh, the costs are coming in higher than we projected, but we did get a, an earmark in the federal budget for some money to offset some of that. And we're also applying for Ohio Department of Mental Health capital dollars to minimize the local cost as much as possible. Um, and hopefully, we're hoping to break ground in September or October. <sighs> Covered a lot there. What questions you do you have? You did. I know I did, and that, Barb, that wasn't even <laughs> this governor. That, he said yeah. you know, behavioral health was his priority. He was not kidding. So, Gee. any questions? <laughs> How are recent board appointees working out? Have they settled in? Um, we actually had one who was filling uh, a, a term that um, attended the June board meeting. We have orientation for all of them tomorrow. Okay. Um, that went fine. We've had contacts with all of them. So yeah, so far it looks good. I have a, a couple of questions for you, Deanna. Thank you for the information. Mm -hmm. It's great to get an update. Um, the campus, the Bixby campus, you know where where are you on the facility that you're planning or you know thinking about out there well we, we continue to have conversations with our board and our infrastructure and facilities committee about how to provide service space for our providers but we've taken no action and made no progress since we met last we're still in the discussion phases okay. that, was, that, was a year, that was over a year ago yeah. mm -hmm. yep but Remember, we have that Meadow Center project, and frankly, we are a, we are a medium-sized board with a small board staff. So that Meadow Center project has really been our priority. So, um, is that in Mount Gilead? Mm -hmm. 950 Meadow Drive is between JFS, the Community Services Building, and Kroger. Okay. So if you go in that yeah, little driveway to the it's south, just right across the street where we have our DKM yeah, meetings. Oh, yep. Okay. Yep. We we actually built that building in 1990 with um, state capital dollars, not OMAS dollars, and a small loan that was taken out by the county commissioners that the board co-signed for and then paid back over time. So we're gutting that building. It's about 11,000 square feet, and we need to bring it up to code. We need to bring it in compliance with ADA. It's really not, you know, we we it needs work. 
and then adding about 9,000 square feet to add two other providers to that building. Okay. Um, the other question was, you know, we've started to get funds for the opioid settlement, mm -hmm. and I'm curious how, and your agency will get some of those funds, obviously, mm -hmm. with others. How, you know, what are you thinking along those lines? So a couple things. One thing I will say, and I, I don't want to, um, I will say this. The immediate need, short to intermediate term, is not for money for services. We have that. We need office space and workforce. And to the extent that we can, you know, use dollars around those two needs, it would be beneficial. My hope was really to look at that in terms of capital, what we could do with that in terms of capital needs. Um, and and I, I say that um, our renewal with our 0.5 replacement, the levy passed in November of last year, it starts collection this coming January. I gotta make sure I get this right. We have one more year of collection. Um, and you know, at this point in time, service dollars is not the need. We have multiple allocations from the Ohio Department of Mental Health and federal dollars. Because they're restricted, sometimes it's difficult to expend them all, but the biggest reason they're not all expended is because we don't have workforce and service space. So it all goes back to that. Um, what is your official position then on House Bill 523? Oh, our, our board passed a resolution on June 16th in support of it. I think it's critical to the modernization of our system and to clarifying um, what board's authority really is. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, give some flexibility in terms of board composition. I, I, I will flatly say I, I would prefer as the executive director, and I'm certainly not um, ask the board for their opinion on this. We've discussed the elements of 523. I would prefer not to have a conversation every four years about changing board size radically. Um, you know, I think there's a time and a place for it, but the, if the change is a reduction, it's accomplished by attrition. By the time those board members term out, you're almost to the next four year window of reconsidering that. Um, it also slightly increases the percentage of board members uh, appointed by commissioners. It goes up from 60% to 67%. So you get, you know, in terms of your appointment authority, an extra mm -hmm. half a person, really. Half um, a person, okay. So, I wondered how that was So okay. those, the only, the only two elements I would even have minor concerns about are the frequency of that consideration of board size yeah. and you know, if there were to come a time when it would be decided we would be a nine member board, we have two counties, we have 250 some thousand people. It's difficult to accomplish, you wanna talk about equity, representation now. So to reduce the board size would make um, meeting the board composition requirements really, really tough. But those for me are minor concerns in comparison to 340036D. That code section, and I'm not an attorney, so I'm gonna be very clear about that, has been the basis for the majority of litigation in Ohio, in my, to my knowledge, that has occurred around this contracting process. So to pick that language up and move it to the contract where both parties can negotiate fairly, to me seems like a very logical thing to do. Our board is fully in support of that. And without being specific, we have experienced that issue. We have twice. What do you think of the prospects of that legislation in lame duck? You, you... Well, um, they had proponent testimony, testimony to that behavioral health services and, oh, my screen just went dead, but I guess it's, no, it's okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, just revealed my, oh wow. Um, we have proponent testimate, testimony to that subcommittee. We um, submitted written testimony. Um, they did not have opponent testimony. This um, representative who sponsored the legislation is not going to go away um, he, for a lot of reasons. I mean, he is, this is the second, I believe, I believe 
Don't quote me on this. The second time he has sponsored similar legislation, so I think if it doesn't go through in lame duck, we'll have a strategy for what to do moving forward. I think one of the first things I said is I'm aware this is a marathon, not a sprint, um, but it is, we need to bring that code section into current behavioral health care times and this legislation in our board association's opinion um, does that. The opposition is, is vendors, suppliers of the services, is that? Yes. What is your current board number again? 14. 14. And we, we have a full board at the moment. Okay. What's the logic of having an even number for a yeah, board? That seems very illogical by any standard. Well, you'd have to ask whoever was in the General Assembly <laughs> when this was up. So originally, I tell you, most boards were 18 member boards and they reduced it to 14 out of some, in particular rural board areas, who simply didn't have 18 people to serve. So they were never full, ever. And there's language in 340 about how long you have to fill a spot. I mean, it just wasn't functional. So not sure what they were thinking when they decided 14. Um, I'm not, I don't have the answer to that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Deanna, boy, challenging. Oh, gee. We really appreciate the briefing. Well, I appreciate all of you listening. I do. I'm the green one, right? All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we can proceed. Item number eight, resolution number 22-632. In the matter of certification of delinquent accounts to county auditor for accounts to be assessed payable year 2023 20, taxes. So moved. Second. Discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. Eric McPeak, Deputy Director of Operations for the Regional Sewer District. We're certifying um, right around 4.02% of our accounts uh, for tax reimbursement. And this is along what we've seen the last couple of years. And, Again, any questions you might have, we're expecting over 100% capture if there are any late fees or 100% capture um, of these overdue billings. Okay. Questions? Vote, oh, please. Vote on motion 22-632. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Thank Resolution Thank number 22-633. In the matter of granting the petition to vacate in part the drainage improvement for this SRI Serebi Temple. So moved. Second. Discussion. Good morning, Commissioners. Brett Bacon, Delaware Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, these next three motions concern the Sri Sai Baba Temple, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, it's a single pair, single parcel project, or, or two projects actually, uh, on Lewis Center Road. Um, the reason we have proceeded to this point is um, the improvements consist of a couple basins that capture water from their parking lots and then a, a larger open channel that bisects the property. Um, the, the improvements that are in existing today, the easements, they would like to construct some structures within the drainage easement as it exists today that we simply cannot permit um, based on the easement language and would it hinder our ability to do maintenance work on their basins. The basins really only capture water from their parking lot and convey it to the open channel. Therefore, they would not meet our current threshold of, of accepting or requiring improvements to go on to the drainage maintenance program if that were to come in today. So we have worked with them to, to vacate in part their one project, uh, basically to take the easement off of, of maintenance and remove the, the easement that's associated with that basement, basin off of maintenance maintain the open channel as it goes through because it still conducts a, a good amount of off-site water. And then their second uh, project that came online in 2016, very similar to the other basin, really doesn't convey any off-site water, so there's, there's no need to have that on maintenance. They're able to perform that. So you're themselves. saying that it will not have impact on anyone downstream? Correct. Period, that is correct. Because this would, that would be a bad thing. Yes, yes. So the, the improvements that's that we're proposing or, or they're requesting to be vacated really only affect their property. There's no impact to off-site properties. They have the ability to perform those, those uh, needed maintenance on those basins because it is their property, and, and therefore there's really no community or, or necessary It doesn't create any situation where down the road they could make some changes that could affect other property no, owners? No, it would only affect their that, property. Just want to make sure yep, that absolutely. we protect 
Good question. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Vote, please. Vote on motion 22-633, Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Merrill. Aye. Mr. Batten. Aye. Resolution number 22-634, in the matter of accepting a permanent drainage easement from SRI Sri Sai Baba. Sri Sai Baba Temple Society of Ohio. So moved. Second. Discussion. Vote. Vote on motion 22-634. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Resolution number 22-635, in the matter of granting the petition to vacate the drainage improvements for the Chi Shabai Temple Society of Ohio parking lot expansion. So moved. Second. Discussion? Vote. Vote on motion 22-635, Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Resolution number 22-636, in the matter of approving a ditch maintenance petition and a ditch maintenance assessments for North Orange Park. So moved. Second. Discussion. Okay. Th this is a uh, somewhat unique situation where this is an area of, of open channel, uh, I'll, I'll call it swale, that is in the North Orange Park, and if you're familiar with the area, it'd be just south of the swimming pool. Uh, between the swimming pool and the soccer fields. An area that uh, both Orange Township and ourselves and the county engineers had, had assumed was on maintenance for some time since the early 2000s. Uh, in, in digging through some paperwork, it, it appears that though the recommendation was made to place this area on maintenance, it was never formally done. Uh, we had been maintaining the area, thinking that it was on maintenance when we discovered this. We started working with Orange, Town Orange Township to formally place this area on maintenance. So this is uh, the petition to, to create a new single-payer project with Orange Township being the only beneficiary. And then the second motion would be to set the, or accept the drainage easement over top of that area. So the past improvements or things you've done, they just go away, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Was that substantial cost or m m nominal? Um, nominal, nominal. This is really um, what prompted the, the, I'll say the thought process here is when we started looking at this, um, we really figured out we did not have a drainage easement to be doing work in. So this is rectifying that situation. Orange Township supports this? Absolutely. Yep. So they filed the petition and, and are granting the easement to ah, the county okay. to, to do the maintenance. Makes sense. Sure. Vote, please. Vote on motion 22 636. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Resolution number 22 637 in the matter of accepting a permanent drazen easement from Orange Township. So moved. Second. Discussion. This is we just the easement for, for that project. <laughs> Vote, please. Vote on motion 22 637. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Resolution Thank number 22 638 in the matter of approving owner's agreement for Wilson Road multi use path phase one. So moved. Second. Discussion. Yes, good morning, Commissioners. Lee Bodnar, Administrator for the County Engineer. Um, what you are considering is the uh, construction of a multi use use pathway uh, on Wilson Road and it's uh, in cooperation with North Store Development uh, and located just west of North Kalina Road in Brookshire Township. Uh, this will allow us to do the inspections on that and we would uh, recommend your approval. Any questions? Vote please. Vote on motion 22-638. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Resolution number 22-639, in the matter of approving a drainage maintenance petition and the ditch maintenance assessment for the reserve at Zyota Bluff. So if. Second. Discussion. For your consideration, commissioners, this is an 18-lot subdivision off of Butts Road in Concord Township, and uh, everything has been reviewed, and uh, we would recommend your approval to have this placed upon the uh, county drainage maintenance program. Okay. Vote, please. Vote on motion 22-639. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. <clears throat> resolution number 22-640. A resolution of necessity to levy a renewal of an existing tax with an increase in excess of the 10 mil limitation for the purpose of providing senior citizen services. So moved. Second. Discussion.
Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to thank you, uh, commissioners, for this time, for allowing this time for me to speak with you uh, about our levy renewal um, with a, a 0.1 increase. Um, I am Farrah Wall, CEO at SourcePoint. Um, and I also have with me Allison uh, Yeager and many of our board members and members of our executive team are here uh, this morning. Um, I, I would like to first start by talking a just a little bit about our mission, vision, and values. Um, you know, our, the mission of SourcePoint is to help our community set a course to live well. After 55, we have a vision of a community where every person, 55 and over, is empowered to live their life to their fullest. Um, and the values that we do, that we fulfill those um, with our respect, compassion, inter interdependence, excellence, stewardship, and advocacy. So um, we've been serving the community for 30 years. In fact, um, we, will, we celebrated our 30th anniversary in June of this year. And the, our, our path began in 1991 when concerned citizens of social service organizations, older adults, and elected officials came together, including county commissioners and city um, council, came together and began talking about the needs of the older adults um, in Delaware County. And at the time, local service providers were um, were limited and had very lengthy waiting lists. Um, and that was kind of the norm in terms of home care providers and other service providers in the county. And, and consequently, what happened is many individuals were placed into expensive long-term care, um, both prematurely as well as unnecessarily many times. Um, our community need, needed a system um, of coordinated care for those that were most in need, and SourcePoint emerged in 1992 to support those needs and to fill that void. Um, we've proudly served the community ever since that time, um, and as I say, we, we celebrated our 30th anniversary in uh, June of this year. So SourcePoint's success has been driven um, through our thoughtful planning. This is something that we've taken um, very seriously um, since my predecessor, uh, Bob Horrox, as well as, um, as my, my tenure since, since July of 2019. Um, in pre preparation for our, our uh, next, or our, yes, the, our next uh, strategic plan, we conducted research that started in 2021 and concluded in 2022. This included interviews, um, surveys of in-home care clients, caregivers, enrichment center members, volunteers, um, stakeholders, including yourselves, um, and um, management as well as other staff members were also, um, as, and board members were also uh, interviewed. As well as, 20, as, as well as that, the key f through that process, I should say, the key findings from that research identified many positive things, um, several of which are listed here in terms of our strengths. And I would highlight just a couple of these, and that is our positive reputation within the community. We had over um, 864 members of the community participate um, in the community survey, and they highlighted the positive re reputation, um, the asset that we bring to the community for older adults, and that they also supported, um, felt that the voters should continue to support the levy, um, fund, the, funds the source point and the services that we provide. It also identified some of the, challenge, the challenges that we have ahead of us and that we need to overcome. Um, and these are really driving factors that affect SourcePoint's cost today 
as well as um, our, into our immediate future. And some of these things you'll recognize, um, Deanna had talked about the work workforce, that we are particularly being impacted not only with the in-home uh, behavioral health services that she spoke of, but particularly our in-home care provider services are greatly impacted. The, the um, workforce in home, home care, in-home assistance is, um, has hit a crisis that also began many years before the pandemic, but has been exacerbated um, since the pandemic. Rising food costs has a, a, a significant impact on our Meals on Wheels program and our dining center program. And we're also experiencing volunteer recruitment, Those, that also. But most important and most significant is the population growth. Um, Deanna talked about the, how the population growth has driven what happens here with mental health, and it's true for us as well and particularly the 85 and over subset of our population has significantly uh, been impacted. This slide shows you the growth that we've seen um, between 2010 and 2020. You'll see the percentage, this is the percentage of growth. The percentage of growth um, in the blue bar, that represents the total population. The percentage of growth in the red bar, that's the percentage growth in the 55 plus population. The, most, um, the total population increased by 23%, that's what that represents, 46% for the 55 and over. While it's easy to predict um, who, is, who will age that are living here now, what's very difficult to predict is how many will migrate into our county. And because we're a county who actually has significant migration into our county, that is, um, it, we expect that those um, estimates are probably underestimated. Um, in 2020, um, the population of 55 and over um, rose to 52,990. In 2025, Scripps Gerontology Center predicts that we'll see another 23% increase in that population. And by 2030, we're looking at a 41% increase from the 2020 um, at, uh, population of 55 and over. The population growth of the age of those age 85 and over will grow even faster, increasing from 2020 to 2035 by 70%. And this is significance because while disability can occur at any age, um, the potential increases with age. The first of the baby boomers turned 75 in 2021, and our, um, our, the majority of our clients, or the average age of our clients, is 78. So you can see as the, the older population um, continues to grow, the more likely they will be to need the in-home care supportive services that we <laughs> offer. This, these two graphs represent our in-home care services. Um, the first graph is the number of client, or the, excuse me, the number of in-home care clients that we serve, and 45% of our meal of our clients, in-home care clients, also receive meals, and that is the, represented in the number of meals that will be served, have been served, and will be served as we move forward. We expect to serve over 12,000. Older adults from 2024 through 2028, um, our, which is, would be our next levy cycle. Since 40, as I mentioned, 45%, we expect a growth in our meals, and we're looking at a five-year projected total production production of 1.5 million meals um, during that same time period. Likewise, we um, also project growth in the number of um, individuals that take part in our community programs, which we view as um, our preventative programs with the health and wellness programs that we offer, and educational um, and engagement opportunities that we offer through community programs. With the information gathered through the research um, and the environmental scan, as well as results from a SWOT analysis, we were able to develop our strategic goals which guide the next several years. 
Um, the good news is that with levy support, SourcePoint has the services and system in place in order to keep pace with the population growth. Um, the essence of what we need to achieve can be summed up in five broad goals which are highlighted here and I'll talk about it over the next few slides. Um, managing growth and capacity, you know, that is the number one uh, goal that was identified through our strategic plan which was just approved by our board and um, you know managing growth and capacity means keeping a watchful eye and making sure that our our programs and services are um, are meeting those needs and that we're keeping pace um, and and developing the capacity in order to to continue to meet those needs reach access and engagement um, you know enabling all residents of, of Delaware County who are 55 and over to have access to programs and services to meet their individualized needs and again to fulfill our mission and vision um, in helping them to live their life at, at the fullest. Scope and capacity, um, or excuse me, scope and change, um, establish priority areas and ensure appropriate allocation of available resource, making sure that the resources are going to the most critical needs of the older adults in our county. Awareness and image, always increasing our awareness because of that migration, because of that changing population that we're serving, we're always in need of, of making sure that people know that we're here and that they come to us early that they recognize us, that our name recognition is top of mind so that they know they, when they do need this, us, they know where to come. Um, and quality, always quality. It's the, it's a, it drives decisions, we're looking to drive our decisions with quantitative and qualitative data so that we continue to provide the highest quality of information programs and services um, that meet high standards. Now, the financial overview. Source, Source Point is committed to, effic to efficiency and has always endeavored to keep administrative costs in check. Our combined administrative costs from 2016 through 2021 were 9.5%, far below the national recommendation of best practice for nonprofits. During the next levy cycle, only direct service staff will be added and only if deemed necessary um, to meet the needs of the growing population. In 2020, SourcePoint spent 85% of our budget on serving and supporting older adults and caregivers. 63% um, excuse me, 62% was for in-home care and meals, um, that includes Meals on Wheels and our dining program. And then 20 3% um, was for community programs, and that includes our insurance counseling, um, helping folks through our new to Medicare classes, our caregiver support, and caregiver, um, family caregiver, caregiver, that's what that refers to, supporting our family caregivers, health and wellness, um, education, and then the ever important, something we, we learned during the pandemic, how important socialization was and keeping people engaged and active, um, engaged with their community. Historically, property, the property tax levy has provided 75 to 85% of SourcePoint's revenues. In our current levy cycle, SourcePoint committed to raise over $10 million in non-levy funding. And by the end of this year, I'm happy to say we'll re re we will reach that goal, and that's actually a year ahead of schedule. Great. Um, to remain good stewards of our resources, including taxpayer dollars, Sorts Point commits to uh, raise $11.8 million in non-levy funding over the next five-year levy cycle. Delaware County voters have consistently supported a modest levy for senior services in our community. After a year-long planning process, we respectfully request that the commissioners place a 1.3 renewal plus an additional 0.1 mil levy for a total of 1.4 mil on the November 2022 ballot. We believe that funds from this levy combined with 
with those that will be raised by source point, that over 11 million, will enable us to keep pace with the growth of our older population over the next five years. With the approval of, from the voters, new costs will be $35.10 per $100,000 of, $100, of assessed property value. And while any increase is difficult, um, a modest increase of $3.50 per year compared to what we pay today is the difference um, that that would be. Um, why the increase? I think we've demonstrated that we do take pride in being good stewards of our resources, including those taxpayer dollars. And prior to the strategic planning process, and I know I spoke of this with each of you individually, it had been our goal to bring to you um, a request for a renewal. However, however, due to the growth of the population and of those that we will serve, the renewal alone would not do enough to sustain our current system of services. Um, this proposed levy funding will allow us to sustain vital aging services we put place for the last 30 years and maintain our support of the growing older population of Delaware County. So now I'd like to offer the opportunity for questions. Okay, thank you very much. You're any welcome. questions from the commission? I don't have any questions. We had a very, let's say, in-depth conversation on the topic and yes. the challenge I gave you and I, since you have board members here is uh, I think anytime we have an increase in the, what we're asking from the taxpayers, they have a right to expect uh, us all to be fiscally responsible and how we use those dollars. And I just ask and remind everyone that we have that responsibility and uh, understanding the need of growth in our county, uh, that we continue to keep that in mind as we uh, decide where we spend those dollars. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple couple things. Um, we've also had a competitive conversation. I don't know if Kim's here or not, but Kim's, yes, she is. <laughs> there she is. Yes, Kim did a nice job, very nice job of, of doing the projections and running this the st statistics so that we could understand yes you know, the, the impact of the increased population and the increase in services and uh, the costs associated with them. Um, you didn't really focus on um, in, in asking for the increase. You didn't really focus on the fact that your costs are going up. Yes. And, you know, the inflation is, <laughs> you know, yes, we are, and we factored in the projections, 3% revenue increase based on the increased uh, housing, basically, or increased real estate um, in generating the 3% increase in revenue, but your costs are going up more than that. Yes. In addition to the population growth. So those are two important factors. Yes, but very, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and we touched on it on one of the slides, but not, not significantly. Our meal costs are really um, growing because of food, or food costs, um, as well as staffing. You know, we, in order to maintain our staffing, we, it's important for us to be able to be um, somewhat competitive, and we're competing with, with other food service um, businesses. Um, which is which is a challenge, um, and so yes, we're seeing increase in labor costs as well as, as food and supply costs that are uh, above um, the the increase that we're seeing with the growth in new housing. So thank you for for yeah, raising I that. that. Was an important point. It's mm -hmm. it's rate increase and activity increase. Uh, right. You know, driving uh, costs. Um, and, and again, we've talked about this, but I think it's important to point out as well, the reason you're going on the ballot now in August, tomorrow, yes. or not, not tomorrow, but yeah, the deadline is this week, to get yes. on the ballot <laughs> in November, why you're doing that now instead of next year, and that this will not go into effect until 24. That's so exactly. It impact 23's tax levy. Yes, that, thank you. Um, we are going on to the ballot now because we learned that there is not likely to be a spring uh, primary in 2023, and our, our levy, our current levy, expires at the end of 2023. So this new levy would begin in January of 2024 with the first receipts coming in during that first quarter. Um, 
So thank you for, for bringing, yeah. bringing that well, up. And to emphasize yes. that point, it's really a cost savings to the taxpayers by doing it in November because the yes. cost would fall on you if it did not happen. Right. Have yes, so. and, and it, would have, it would have probably driven up our, our ask because um, the cost of, of doing a special election, and particularly if, regardless, even if there's, there, we're sharing it, we're going to be paying a significant amount to add um, another election on for 2023. So, yes, thank you. Yeah, it's very unusual. We, have, we probably won't have a primary next spring. I know. <laughs> I was quite surprised. I, I can't remember the last time that happened, but it looks likely that it will. So, anyway, again, thank you for all the work this, that's gone on this. Thank the board for, you know, for their attention to this and commitment to remaining fiscally um, cautious. Um, I know we appreciate it. The taxpayers appreciate it. And lastly, I mean, the Source Point is just one of those organizations that provides outstanding, um, mm -hmm. you know, community services. And I, we just, we all appreciate it. We all know people who use it and use it ourselves. I mean, it's, it's just a great organization. It's a, one of the real true community assets that makes Delaware County, you know, an attractive place for um, younger people as well as seniors to, to live and, and move into. So. Right. Many seniors come here to be closer to their grandchildren. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, it does. I thank you for that. Thank you for that compliment. I had just wondered about uh, the ability to get volunteers for your Meals on Wheels, since that is one of your many vital programs. Yes, we, we have, um, we do continue, most of our meals are delivered by volunteers, but we've had, we have seen an increase in the use of staff um, to fill in for those volunteers. We have volunteers, you know, who, call, who are calling off. We have had some volunteers who have been taking advantage of the ability to travel again. Um, so that's part of it because many of our volunteers are also um, 55 and over. Um, the, the majority of our volunteers are, are older themselves. So they, um, it, that has been a challenge. And we're also looking at a different, we're in a different environment when it comes to volunteering and volunteer recruitment. And um, partnering with um, businesses and, or, and organizations because many employees are actually looking to their employer to support their volunteering. And so we're looking at that in our future as a, a possible direction for us to, to gain more volunteer support and engage um, um, you know, companies and private businesses to, to allow their employees to come and, and volunteer for us, um, even possibly during their work days. This is something that, that many businesses are starting to offer as a, um, as a benefit um, that their employers are looking for. So we're trying to look at new ways of both recruiting and retaining and kind of uh, developing our volunteers into you know, super volunteers that kind of help guide um, newer volunteers. So, um, so yes, that is, but that does, um, we do have more folks that are filling in. Certainly during the pandemic, a lot of our staff were filling sure. in for the volunteers because the volunteers also were um, staying at home. So, um, and our meals didn't stop, <laughs> didn't miss a day. Oh, that's, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so if someone wishes to volunteer, how do they do it then? All they need to do is call us, let them know, let us know that they're interested and and that's three six three six six seven seven. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, I, unrelated to the levy, uh, I sent you an email about three months ago regarding the recycling event. Yes. Uh, we happened to drop off some stuff. It was extremely well done, and the the staff at uh, Source Point, uh, which played a role in that, <laughs> uh, you guys did an outstanding job. It really, really was efficient, and I thought it was a uh, it was done in a way that made it very. As quick as it could be with the number of cars that are lined up. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thank um, you for one, your great presentation. Yeah, one other comment I know, and we talk about this, it doesn't really, isn't really directly impacting the levy, but transportation. I know transportation is a huge issue for seniors in Delaware County yes. and others. Um, and I know we encourage you to work with the Delaware County Transit and um, Absolutely. DD and JFS and so on to develop a comprehensive
transportation plan for those needing transportation in our community. I know you're working on it, but I just want yep. to highlight that's really important. Yeah. And I'm going to yes. tag onto that. I think one of the things that when you have all these different agencies, there are times when we can work together, and, and, and that's just a statement I'd make to anyone who's in the room. We've got to find ways to work together for the benefit of the taxpayers and not live on our little islands. And I'm not suggesting that's happening. No, right. But it, it's possible yeah. it, it could happen, and, and we all need to keep that in mind. Yeah, and, th and that's really important. And something actually, that's something that, that SourcePoint has always taken very seriously is collaborating, not duplicating, not replicating but really bringing the resources that are existing in the community, bringing them together in order to, um, to fulfill the needs and not trying to compete with one another, but finding a way to do it efficiently. So that is something that we've always um, done. That's why we have, um, we have grant programs where we award other nonprofits that are working with seniors, such as the Alzheimer's Association. They have a specialization and we help to support them so that they can expand what they're doing and serve more people. So that works better than us trying to duplicate or replicate what they're already doing. So, um, so yes, that's a very good point and something that, that SourcePoint takes very seriously. And in summary, these are all the things that makes it reasonable and appropriate that people support your levy in November. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And now <laughs> we will vote. Red vote on motion 22-640. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Merrill? Aye. Mr. Benton? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Fair. And that brings us to administrator reports. Good morning. On Wednesday evening, we'll have our monthly finance authority meeting. I don't suspect it'll be a long meeting, but just wanted to let you know. Thanks. Okay. Our deputy administrator, Dawn, is mm -hmm. We have the health fair this Friday, so hopefully everyone can um, come and participate. It will be at the Hamilton Williams Center, and looking forward to um, a good turnout. It's been two years since we've had one. <laughs> the wellness deadline is when? Uh, okay, the wellness deadline is August 12th, um, but then blood work and the physician's um, physical needs to be done on the 11th. Or before. I'm sorry. Or before. <laughs> or before. You said it'd be done on the 11th. I'm being silly. Oh. Being done on the 11th or before. So yes. A little humor exactly. over your face in my I guess. I'm following you now. <laughs> Let's see who goes next. Uh, Commissioner Benton. Uh, just a couple things. SEPCO, we had our board meeting uh, last Friday morning, and um, it, you know we're looking at another, unfortunately, significant increase in our health care uh, premiums um, through SEPCO. Um, you know, again, and it's driven by claims. Our claims are just high; you know, they're increasing. Um, so. Anyway, well, I don't think it, it doesn't, you know, numbers aren't finalized, but it doesn't look like it'll be as high as last year, but it's going to be higher than we would like, certainly. Um, regional planning had a meeting Thursday evening. That went very well. Um, again, Dave Stites does a nice job of chairing that and keeping that meeting going and doing it very professionally. Morpsey Executive Committee is Thursday. You know, Genoa Township Business Association is Wednesday morning. And um, I did get a zoo annual report. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody got this or not. Yep. Um, and zoo, you know, doing great things. We love having a zoo, and they're just—it's just a lot of fun. We go every year a bunch of times. And but I just did want to point out one thing on the front cover. Did anybody uh, notice? There's no. one. The, you the animal up in the upper right-hand corner. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not that. The uh, one in the lower left-hand corner. Yeah. No, no. One in the upper left-hand corner. Yeah. No. Well, I don't know what it be. It's the lower right corner. It's, it's the big picture of the golfer. <laughs> So I just wanted to point that out. Um, there is a golf course at the zoo. zoo. It's called the Safari. And I just admire them for putting a golfer on the front page of their annual report. Uh, did you have anything to do with that? No, actually I didn't. <laughs> Commissioner Ben big on his golf. I just wanted think. to highlight yeah. that they recognize yeah. how important golf is, as well as the zoo. Do we have any? I have nothing to report. We do I get a chance? Gary gets that will get a shot? Pardon? Do I get to go? To Commissioner Merrill. Oh, <laughs> yes. That's right. I think I will I, let you go. I think yes. you're going to exclude me deliberately. Uh, yeah. uh, I have three things. Um, 
I attended the One Delaware event out at Little Bear on last Friday, and uh, two things, actually. I thought it was really well done by uh, 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 Chip Holcomb, who came from Columbus One to speak, and it was really well done. And uh, uh, But the other thing that was impressive was Little Bear has been in a remodeling stage. It was closed for a number of years. I think it may have been in bankruptcy. I don't recall that for sure, but regardless, it closed. And uh, they're doing a pretty good job of uh, reviving it, and the the owners spoke. And it's, it's always good to see something come back into use rather than setting idle. And what is Little Bear? Uh, it's a it's a uh, area where people can come and have meetings, and uh, they do have miniature golf there now. So I, that may be what you're referring to. Well, and, a, and a golf course, and a regular. Or well, kind of a part three. Small, small golf. Yeah. So anyway. But you, you're right, have a golf there. I don't want to exclude that after I bragged about them. Uh, number two, I attended the Furball Gala set for Saturday night with Humane Society. And the person sitting next to me was Judge Chimeter, and we, uh, I guess we were each other's dates, as it turned out. We were, well, it's for animals, but it would not be logical. But it was extremely, extremely well done. And uh, I guess they had not done it for a couple years because of COVID. And it, Again, one of the things I want to talk about in our county, as they laugh here to my right, uh, they used an example of a, there was an animal in Athens, Ohio, where I was, I spent five years that was blind, really, really in bad health, and they were in a position to take care of it in Athens. Delaware Humane Society stepped up. They took possession of that animal, got it back in as good a health as you can. You know, obviously blind, can't do much about that other than get it back to health. And they found local foster Parents may not be the right word, but lack of a better word, to take that animal. So it speaks well. There's so many examples of good things happen in our county, and that's just one more of those. Now third, um, be sure and vote if you have not already done so. Um, and um, I'm going to make an editorial comment here. Uh, voting is so darn important right now. When you have a federal government in the name of inflation fighting, Passing a bill to raise seven, eight hundred billion, whatever the number is, is ridiculous. People who voting for that should be voted out. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not our county that's going to determine that, but it just shows the reason voting is so darn important. And you can't, in the name of fighting inflation, spend another eight hundred billion plus and think that's a good thing. So that's my editorial comment, uh, and I'll leave it at that. The voting tomorrow is important. I'm glad that uh, we called that to your attention, to our attention. Um, very important. And so we do not have? We do not have need for executive session today. Okay. Then we 